After the success of the Stanley Parable, Davy Reedon began work on a follow-up game. Much like the previous title, his next project would be a wandering game grounded by an omniscient narrator. Only this time, the narrator would be played by Reedon himself, as himself, tracing the work of another developer from their early days as a Counter-Strike mapper to their bolder experiments and up through all of their latest stuff, trying to find meaning and unifying elements across all the games as he goes. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. And if you've seen my episode on Brendan Chung's Blendo games, you may see why this sort of freaked me out the first time through The Beginner's Guide. But hints of Chung's design ethos peek through even this early. They're really simple gags, but they highlight a willingness to toy with player expectations, which is sort of a recurring theme in his games. So it was sort of hard for me to not immediately compare myself to Davy. But we're not here to talk about my insecurities, we're here to talk about Davy Reedens. Or not Davy Reedens, as the case may be. Look, before we're going to be able to have any meaningful conversations about the Beginner's Guide, I think we have to make sure the whole misreading the text as a literal thing is dead and buried. Like, I really can't believe I have to explain this, but the Beginner's Guide is a work of fiction. It is not real. That doesn't necessarily mean that the experiences in Davy Reedon's life didn't inspire it, or that flecks of truth aren't in there. But the idea that a game developer named Coda is a literal person who exists in the real world, whose levels and small games are being sold by Reedon on Steam without his permission, is not a real thing that has happened. I mean, think about it for one second. There's no evidence that Coda exists. We don't get a name or an email address or a website or a Twitter handle or anything. Ignoring that, who would, after a hugely successful indie game like The Stanley Parable, package someone else's work up without licensing it and sell it as their own for money on the biggest gaming platform in the world and act like they wouldn't get caught? Ignoring that, who would possibly edit a series of levels to trigger audio files of themselves having a breakdown and then release that to the internet? I mean, is, is something wrong with me? Because I know that I did an awful thing, and I'm doing it again right now. Like, I'm, I'm showing people your work, but I can't stop myself from doing it. That's how badly I need to feel something again, like I'm an addict. Frank Lance said it was embarrassing that we couldn't cover this game more properly, and I have to agree. I just can't fathom how anyone has entertained the idea that this highly edited, thematically and visually cohesive series of short levels are all made by a single, amateur, anonymous developer and are being sold in violation of copyright against the author's wishes as stated in the work itself. Instead of maybe Occam's Razor here, Davy Reedon simply made another in a line of wandering games that are interested in meta-narratives and how games work. Anyways, Davy, that is video game character Davy, not human being Davy, believes that by looking at Coda's games, he's getting a window into who Coda is. That's different than, say, looking for recurring themes in Coda's works, or watching Coda develop their own particular aesthetic style over time. No, what's posited here is that Davy feels he can absolutely sense who Coda is as a person by playing their games. And that's not subtextual, it's stated outright in the opening of the game. This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. But it turns out that he can't. He can't at all. He fails utterly to discern meaning from Coda's games, or to get a sense of who Coda is and how he thinks. So to give them meaning, Davy changes the games, unbeknownst to the player. One of my favorite subtle moments, one of the earliest moments that villainizes Davy, though you don't really recognize it as such at the time, is when he offers to skip the maze for you in the Whisper Machine level. Apparently the space station has a labyrinth on it. I... Uh, sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip you on past it. Note Davy's self-centered phrasing there. There's no reason for it that I was able to discern, so let's just skip it. 
It's a maze that actually has a real solution and takes only maybe 60 seconds to solve, but Davey doesn't want us to experience the game as it was built. He wants to skip straight to the end, to the big payoff that lets him show off his insights. And he does these selective edits constantly, sometimes without our knowledge. And all of this is in service of Davey showing us just how well the games express who Coda is and what their mental state is. Here's a friend whose work is exhibiting signs of struggle, frustration, anxiety, depression, even. But the depressing thing is that once you've beaten the game, it's clear Davy's reads show so much more about Davy than Coda. Davy's desperate not to feel alone, so he senses that he's getting into Coda's headspace just by playing these games. Davy needs things to make sense and have a meaningful structure, so he adds the lighthouse to all of Coda's games as a sort of thematic anchor that didn't exist before. Davy can't imagine being motivated by anything other than an extrinsic reward, so he adds win states or at least conclusions to several of Coda's games. But, of course, it can't last. The music stops, your companion is gone, it's time to leave. The door at the top of the hill is now open as well. Again, you can't stay in the dark space for too long. You just can't. You have to keep moving. It's how you stay alive. And to be fair, it's not like this is the first game that's needed some modification to be playable. Like the house cleaning game. You know, that one used to actually loop the cleaning chores and you just cleaned a house forever. I had to cut it off so that you could exit the house and the game would actually end. These are all things that Davey brings to the table, things that were not there in the original titles. His reads are all invalid, not just because they're, you know, wrong, but because they misrepresent the text by changing it and editing it. But above all, Davey needs validation from others. He needs to be told what he's doing is right, and that he's smart, and that he's special. So he shows off the modified, bastardized, edited games to the public, and explains how deep they are for being windows to the soul, against the wishes of Coda. And more than anything, that's what makes Davey a villain. A tragic, sympathetic villain, sure, but a villain all the same. I'm afraid that I did something really stupid because I don't like myself. As for Coda, well, he's harder to discern. All we know of him comes from an unreliable narrator, and if we try to make any guesses about who Coda is from the games he left us, well, we'd be making the same mistake as Davey. We can probably safely assume that he made most of the games that we played, and that he lived in or around Sacramento around 2010. Really though, Coda is more of an idea than a character. He's a concept that acts as an ideal for Davey to fail to achieve. And more than anything, who is Coda is left unanswered in part because Davey's the only person in the game who's met him, and as it turned out, Davey never really got to know Coda as well as he thought. Indeed, no one in this game, or playing this game, really knows Coda, which is part of the point. It turns out you can't really know someone just by consuming their works. I come away from Doom feeling like I know at least a little bit about who these guys are. For all its pointless violence and a complete lack of a plot, Doom is a personal statement about its developers by its developers. I... uh... no comment. The only other personality hint we get about Coda is the way the game kinda uses women to codify the nature of Coda and Davy's relationship. It's kind of a flimsy motif to make any strong statements about, but once you pick up on it, it's also hard to entirely deny that there's something going on there. Gender is often kept ambiguous throughout the game, but the player character is a woman in The Killing Machine and the game where you can only move backwards. Both of which feel somewhat autobiographical, as one's a short meditation on knowing where to go next in life, and the other is about dealing with a creative lull. And the stage game has the player going to a woman who has the player's dream job of animal photography and hoping to glean some advice about how she does it but failing due to social awkwardness, which resonates with the game overall, I think. Then there's the sobbing woman abandoned in one of the cells from the jail game, who, interestingly, is the only character without a block for a head. That could be read as Coda's muse during this frustrating time of creative stagnation. But after finishing the game, it's obvious it could also have been placed there by Davey to sell us on the idea that this was more of the window to Coda's soul, that his depression was real. Then there's the tone of the later part of Davy's discussion about Coda, which is seeped in a sort of clingy guy who wouldn't quite get the picture tone. Because I haven't been able to find any other way to reach you. I've tried everything. And so a part of me has hope that if I put this compilation out into the world, and if I put my name on it, that maybe enough people will play it so that it'll find its way to you, so that I can tell you that I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? Coda states that Davy has infected his personal space, and that Coda can't give Davy what he wants, but that Davy isn't Coda's problem to solve to begin with. 
Again, this is how you would talk about a Facebook stalker, and the result of all these little touches is to make the relationship feel coded as such. None of this is to suggest that Coda is literally a woman, though given the unreliable nature of the narrator, that's not impossible, but it does present an interesting way to further frame the game's main relationship as poisonous. Davey is a creeper who violates privacy and trust after placing someone else on a pedestal and is obsessed with seeing them again. Just a thought. I mean, you know, it's not not there. Anyways, in making Video Game Davey the villain for attempting to read way too much personal stuff into games that actually had very little personal stuff in them, I do think The Beginner's Guide has set itself up as something of a trap for critics. See, The Beginner's Guide came out nearly two years after Davey Reedon, the real flesh-and-blood human being Davey Reedon, wrote a blog post about suffering anxiety and depression after the success of The Stanley Parable, how he felt like he lost control over what the game meant and what he liked about it to his audience and how he searched desperately for external validation, only to find that hunger ever-growing. And it's really tempting to draw parallels, to argue that this game is a direct result of those emotions and those anxieties, that Coda and Video Game Davey are really two parts of the same person, the creative, impossible-to-know muse making things for their own sake, and the post-Stanley developer desperate for validation. But to say something like that definitively is to make the same mistake that Video Game Davy did, to claim that I see the person in the work, to bring in my own lampposts from outside the game and say they're signifiers of meaning. Well, I'm not going to fall for that, and I'm going to keep this video wholly within the text. This is, I suspect, the reason Reedon is fine with people confusing Coda for a real person and hasn't really done much of anything to clamp down on those debates. It highlights his point. If we can't distinguish between easily verifiable fiction and hard fact, how can we possibly gleam any meaningful insight about an author's mental state from their work? How many people thought real-world Davey was having an actual emotional breakdown right there on their computer at the end? I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. I want to know how to doubt. I want to know how to be a good person. I want to know how not to hate myself. Please. I'm fading. And how different from that would I be if I said this game was real world Davey Reedon processing the experiences after the Stanley Parable? We'd both be making broad proclamations about the mind of an author we've never met. We have to be careful about projecting onto the game's creator a mental state that he or she might not have. We have to recognize that this work may fulfill a completely different role for the real Davey than it does for the audience. So if we avoid the temptation to extrapolate to the real Davey Reedon, now there's all this metafiction surrounding the game in addition to the literal text, and all of it is about how much meaning we as players can pull from a game about its creators. If the Stanley Parable was about the relationship between players and games and the conflict between them, it's apparent that the Beginner's Guide is about the relationship between players and developers and the tension that exists there. The act of creation and the act of experiencing a work are two completely different things based on different human drives and with completely different end goals. Davey, again, video game Davey, wanted games to speak to him, to have a point for the player to consume. And Coda's games didn't, and that's okay. Games don't have to be for the players. Plenty of programmers and hobbyist developers have half-finished prototypes laying around, half-explored ideas or experiments in an art style, or just messing with an idea they fancied that they never intended to see the light of day. And some people make games socially, like at game jams and during Ludum Dare. L Ludum Dare? L Ludum Dare? No one seems to agree on the pronunciation. Anyway, here's a really good example. At Lost Levels a few years back, there was a pair of friends who made a fashion game that pretended to be really stat-heavy. But actually, you could only win if you chose the specific clothing items that the friends thought were the coolest. The game was a symbol of their friendship, a riddle only they can solve built as an in-joke that only they got to share. Not every game needs to be playable to be valid. We'll never know why Coda built prisons, not the least of which is because we have an unreliable narrator and can't count on anything we saw, but, but regardless, we're pretty sure he did it often and presumably got something out of it. All of that said, for all of the metatextual mind games and interesting thematic ground, the game does feel rather hostile to critics and pretty defensive of developers. I feel like Room 237 is a nice companion piece to the beginner's guide. In that film, fans of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining espouse various theories on what that film quote-unquote really means, that, say, Kubrick was confessing to the faking of the moon landing, or that the whole film was about the genocide of the Native Americans, or that the whole thing was really an attempt by Kubrick to address the Holocaust. 
Both Room 237 and The Beginner's Guide are about people putting forth reads of a given work, but the unspoken joke of both is that their subjects start from textual evidence, but begin making ridiculous leaps, and in the case of The Beginner's Guide outright falsifying the text, to support their pre-arrived at conclusions. The idea in both of them is that oftentimes our attempts to figure out what a thing is says more about us than it does about the thing. But where both fail is in their choice to criticize the person rather than the mistaken logic. Bad reads aren't a jumping off point for better, more supported reads. They're things we use to mock or criticize the person suggesting them. Room 237 presents its subjects as quirky oddballs with conspiracy theory level reads on a single film. It lets them hang themselves by making false statements, or including audio of interviewees being interrupted by their children during this important analysis about the Holocaust. Meanwhile, Beginner's Guide suggests its subject is villainous and willing to lie and deface the work to attain attention. If fake Davy is sympathetic, it's only in his desperation. He's got some real personal problems to work on, but he's hurt Coda and he's hurt the player by lying to them. If it's a game about the relationship of the developer and the audience, it's decidedly pro-developer and not so great on audiences or on critics. Like, how am I, as a critic, supposed to respond to my job being described like this? But when I took your work and I was showing it to people, it actually felt... <laughs> it felt as though I were responsible for something important and valuable. And the people who played them, they treated me like I was important. They really listened and cared about what I had to say. Even though I was showing your work, it was... I felt good about myself, finally. For a moment, while I had that, I liked myself. Especially since moments later he's having a breakdown because his entire ego is built on top of his ability to tell people how smart games are. What kind of sad person would that be? It feels like it's trying to distance itself from the world. It's a very cold game. The result is a game that uniformly feels cold and indifferent to the player. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago. Really, at the end of the day, I think there's only two ways to look at the beginner's guide. There's the straightforward story of a man who simply wanted so badly for recognition that he destroyed a friend's work to feel better about himself before breaking down. A warning for game developers about how your boundaries might not be respected, and a parable for game critics about going too far and reading too deep. A game that says any analysis of games is mostly self-projection and standing on the shoulders of geniuses to make yourself feel better. A game with a decidedly anti-critic bent. The trouble with that is, I find that read super nihilistic. But the alternative read is that this really is Davy Reedon wrestling with the success of the Stanley Parable, with letting go of complete control of his work to people who will put their own lampposts in, wrestling with the fear that he can't keep making these games and that that creative spark will run out, wrestling with the idea that he's motivated only by the validation of others to keep him going. But if I take that read, then I'm no better than fake Davy, and I've boiled a real flesh and blood person down to a 45 minute game experience. So, I'm either analyzing a game that says analyzing games is often done to the detriment of the work and the benefit of the analyzer, and let's be clear, I have edited this video in a way that helps me make my point, is that any different than Davy skipping the whisper maze in the beginning of the game? Or I'm assigning value to this game based on the mental state and personal life of a man I've never met, and then I am, again, just as bad as Davy. So, which is it? I... I think I know, or at least I thought I did. I Look, I, now I'm afraid to say it because of what it might say about me. And I, like, I'm either projecting myself or I'm projecting Davey onto this stupid game, right? That can't be right, though. That can't be fair. Look, game criticism is about more than that, right? Right? Either I'm seeking validation for telling you all what I think about this game, or I'm boiling a human being down to one of his projects? Is is that really what this game is suggesting? Is, is that what I'm suggesting? Is that what I'm doing here? Or am I doing this to myself by reading my own insecurities into this thing? What does it say that I see so much of myself in such an awful person? Jesus, is this what I've been doing for the last four years? I... I don't know. I... You may need to figure this one out for yourselves. I think I'm going to have to figure out what I'm doing with this show.